Our theme this year was Rotary Connects the World. And I'd like to read you a story that fits in nicely with that theme. It's the story of a young girl living in a land far, far away. She lives in the remote city in the blue-green foothills of the Himalayas. And, and when I say foothills, you have to imagine the Appalachians on steroids. You get there after a three-hour drive over a muddy, single-lane mountain road with the occasional bus or, or semi-wreck at the bottom of a ravine just to show you how quickly something can go wrong. On a good day, you can see the peaks of the Annapurna Range from the single window in the two rooms that she shares with her mother and her father and her brother. And on a bad day, you can't get out of her city because the dirt streets are too muddy or the, or the mountain roads are impassable. It's a very, very different place than any of the cities we're from. But like our hometowns, family bonds are tight. People look out for one another. Joking and laughter are always in the air. Four years ago, a man in the girl's small town decided to start a Rotary Club. Quite a bold step, no nearby clubs, no real support. And just like our Rotary Clubs, they meet once a week, but they meet on an open rooftop on the top of a four-story apartment building at night and under the stars. The women cook food at home and bring it to the meeting where they have a potluck and, and drink and talk until late into the night. The girl's father is a civil servant and decided to join the club and, and the girl would tag along as much as she could. No one, no one chased her away. She enjoyed the banter and listening to the dreams that these new Rotarians had for, for their small part of the world. And she also began to understand that Rotary is huge. 1.2 million members, 30,000 clubs around the globe, and that Rotary spearheaded the fight to eradicate polio and is involved in everything from drinking water initiatives to conflict resolution. Three years ago, the man who started the Rotary Club had an idea. He put an announcement on the Rotary International website telling the world that his new Rotary Club was interested in inviting Rotarians from anywhere in the world to come and visit. And without enough money to travel themselves, they wanted to host and feed anyone able to make the trip to visit them. A Rotary Friendship Exchange chair on the other side of the globe stumbled upon that invitation and in October of 2016, 10 Americans, after a long and, and difficult journey, drove into the girl's town in a couple of old Indian-made Jeeps. All the local Rotarians were in the town square to greet the Americans when they arrived. And the Americans, the Americans laughed when they noticed a small but very energetic 14-year-old girl trying to get all the adults lined up for the perfect group picture. Each day, the local Rotarians took their visitors to a remote mountain village of just a few hundred people. And there they were greeted by the entire village, speeches, dancing, bands, more speeches, food, you name it. Six to seven hours a day, three days in a row, three different villages. And the people living in the villages were the poorest of the poor, all with incomes of under a dollar a day and, and many with no income at all. Those with no income living off the land as, as best they can. And in all cases, what these villages had for schools were rendered unusable by the recent earthquake. So the kids were studying under the blue skies or in the rain, depending on the day. Their outdoor classrooms offered just one thing, just some of the most stunning views in the world. And on the days when the Americans traveled, the girl would search the Jeeps for any corner or crevice that she could squeeze herself into. And when possible, she would join the visitors on their drive up the mountain in the morning and, and back down in the afternoon. 
always listening, always trying to understand, always trying to make herself understood. After four days, the Americans were preparing to leave and as they sat together having lunch, one of them asked a really simple question. Had anyone else thought about how far that spunky girl would take it if she was living in a more developed part of the world? And all 10 agreed that the sky was the limit for her. Someone mentioned Rotary Youth Exchange, which sounded like a great idea, but Rotary in Nepal has no real operating youth exchange program. The girl's English was at such a basic level that she could never go to school in the U.S. and her parents could never afford to have her participate, so, so the idea was quickly dropped. And as the Americans were leaving, one of them gave the girl his Kindle. He downloaded the Harry Potter series onto it, and he told the girl, first of all, to learn English, and second, to contact him when she was done reading all seven of the books. Two years ago, the man was surprised when out of the blue, he received an email from the girl telling him that she was now attending high school in Kathmandu. Kathmandu is a 200 mile drive from the girl's hometown, but the drive takes 10 hours. So although she was relatively close to home, she was in fact quite far from home. And she also mentioned that she'd finished reading the Harry Potter series and joked that she was ready to take a Harry Potter test. The man was impressed and, and contacted the group that had traveled with him to see if, if they had any interest in exploring what Rotary Youth Exchange could do with this unusual situation. The group decided to give it a try. A year and a half ago, the girl started an interact club at her high school and was its charter president. The club began to carry out some small-scale projects, including one called Happy Periods, an effort to keep young girls in school. And at about the same time, contacts were laid and plans were made between Rotary District Governors in Nepal and in the United States and between Rotary Youth Exchange representatives in both countries. Nepal wasn't certified to host youth exchange students, but a, but a one-way exchange was agreed upon. And then with very little assistance from her parents or her local Rotary Club, the girls started working on a very detailed Rotary Youth Exchange application. The same application our Wisconsin students use because Rotary in Nepal didn't have an application. It took her several months to complete. One year ago, the girls sent a very large package of application materials to the United States. And these were reviewed by the Central States Rotary Youth Exchange Organization and by the U.S. State Department's Rotary representative. And the girl was accepted into the program and was sent the paperwork she needed for the next step. This past May, a very nervous girl arrived at the U.S. Embassy in Kathmandu with a piece of paper she'd received from the United States. She was ushered into a small room. She sat down and one of the embassy staff interviewed her. And the interview went well. And with her J-1 visa in hand, the Americans that had traveled to Nepal could now purchase the final two things the girl needed, medical insurance and a plane ticket. On August 17th, 2019, the girl's family and friends waved goodbye to her at the airport in Kathmandu. She flew the six hours to Qatar and then the 14 hours to Chicago where she warmly greeted her first host dad, Andy, and where she gave a great big hug to her second host dad, me. And that's the four-year backstory on how Issa Podel from Agatakachi, Nepal, started high school this fall in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. So, Sir Winston. Mm. I have a question. Have you spent any time in Nepal? Uh, yes, yes, Nepal. 
quite a story. Now, I've heard a story, Edwin, about a 14-year-old girl that you, your group befriended while you were there. When did she go back to Nepal? Wait, 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 wait. Young, young lady over there. Are you from Nepal? Uh, do you know this man, this Edwin? Yes. Well, then sit down. I don't the two of you tell us your story. <laughs> there you are. Here we are. So, Isa, this is it. You've been the main character, the Harry Potter, so to speak, in a story I've told maybe a hundred times this year. And then there's a lot of in assistant governors in our district right now who've heard it probably 10 times and are uh, about up to here with hearing the story. There's a problem with the story, though. It ends when you get to the United States. So what we need to do yet this morning is tell everyone the next chapter. Let everyone know what's happened since you got here and what your plans are for the future. Does that sound all right? Yeah. All right. So one of the first things you and I did after you got here was we went to the Miss Updahl's office, the guidance office at Fort Atkinson High School. Yeah, I remember that. It was the very second day I came here. You and I went to Miss Updahl's office to select my classes for the upcoming year. The first thing was I was really amazed, like how, like how many options were there to choose classes. So in Nepal, if you are in science faculty, you just choose, you can't choose classes. So here you could choose anything, something from science, something from management, which was really amazing. So Ms. Aftal started telling me most of the exchange students just take like not really fun classes and have a couple of study halls and have funds fun but when i saw the classes offered so i re really wanted to take all of them so i did not take any study halls and i did take a couple of harder classes than a normal exchange student do and i took some fun classes like welding as well yeah yeah you did take welding i remember that <laughs> i remember when we walked in there that day because she told you that little story about the other exchange students and i said he said do you want to work your butt off this year or do you want to just take it easy and you said right away i want to work my butt off yeah. so that's really good um your host parents, Andy and uh, Sandy, what did they, they were really pushing extracurricular activities and uh, what did you end up doing? Yeah, I remember the first time I came here, it was kind of weird for me or like amazing that parents here push a lot, a lot for sports. Like in Nepal, parents just push for academics. If you are not in any sports, that's fine. But here, parents push as equal to sports, as equal to like academics, which was really amazing. So my host parents asked me you should join at least something. And I started looking at all the fall activities and I realized I don't know how to swim. <laughs> and then I thought I should, learn, I should learn how to swim. So I joined the swim team so my coaches were expecting that I would compete in at least one meet but I ended up competing in three meets so yeah th that's all because of my coaches as well as my teammates who supported me all the way throughout m my swim team and helped me get settled into the school as well mm -hmm. and I remember the story for the first time the time when I was competing in JV conference it was my last time when I was competing in swim meet as a team from high school. So everyone was cheering for me, even someone from opponent team. I was like, we don't do that in Nepal. We don't cheer up for opponent team. Are you crazy? So they cheered up for me, even though I was the, their opponent. So it was re really emotional. I mm -hmm. even cried. I think we even have some, oh yeah, that's playing. If we look at the screen right now, there you are in the red dot. <laughs> you are absolutely the slowest swimmer I have ever seen in my life. I think. <laughs> It was a two. It was a two hundred meter backstroke, and they laughed you twice. <laughs> yeah, my my host dad used to tell me that she's the fourteenth fastest swimmer in her swim team. Apparently, there are only fourteen, 14 people, people in my swim team. Right, right. So, tell me a little bit more about your host families. But Issa likes to likes to talk, and she's a good talker, and sometimes can get a little bit long winded. We'll need to go through this somewhat quickly. But tell me about your other host or your, all of your host families so and a little I, story about each of them. So, I stayed with three host families. My first host family was the Kalers, and everyone from Fort Atkinson knows that he's known for being sarcastic and funny. So, I have so many funny stories, but I would like to pick this one. On August 18th, we went up north uh, because my host family had a cabin up there. So since I have never slept in a hammock, so we decided I should sleep in a hammock. So uh, 
instead of like going step by step, I tried to put both of my feet in the hammock at once and the hammock flipped right after. <laughs> and my host dad was acting as if he didn't see me. And he was like, Isa, where are you? Where are you? And then he just laughed and laughed. And I know he told everyone in Fort Atkinson that I failed from a hammock. Mm -hmm. And then I stayed with you and Joanna. And it, there as well, I had so many memories, but one I'd like to pick is when I went to really huge cities like Milwaukee in Chicago. Since I watched a lot of Hollywood movies, especially based on Chicago, mm -hmm. where the character would be walking in the like streets of Chicago with coffee, going to right, the cafe. Right. And when I went to Chicago, I felt like I was the main character of the movie or anything. It was like dream come true. Yeah. The, and thirdly, I stayed with the Johnsons. It was after all this COVID stuff happened. So we didn't do a lot of things, but we did try cooking and baking a lot. Surprisingly, my host mom has all the ingredients required for Indian and Nepali cooking. So we did a lot of Indian ne Nepali cooking as well as we did baking. So pro tip for anyone out there who knows how to do henna tattoo design, maybe everyone from Nepal does. So you can just copy your henna tattoo designs in your cookie and you look like a pro cookie decorator. <laughs> so Issa, let's get back to Nepal. Tell us a little bit about your plans for the future and, and what were your impressions when back in 2016, when a bunch of Americans drove into your small city uh, in a bunch of Jeeps? Um, and maybe what, a little bit of what it was like growing up in Nepal. You had that really nice slideshow that you did a while back. Did you bring that along by chance? Yeah, of course I yeah, did. Yeah, good, good. Go ahead. It's on. Okay. So this is the city where I see, no, this is the village where I was born. So it is just 381 kilometers far away from the capital city, Kathmandu, but it takes 10 hours, like 11 hours, almost 10 hours, 58 minutes, which is 11 hours. Can you believe that? It's because of all the roads you have to go through those mount, rocky mountains and all those Himalayas with all those curves and narrow roads. That's why it takes like 11 hours, even though it's just like few 300 kilometers away from the capital city. So that's where I was born in the foothill of Himalayas and mountains. And that's where I grew up. So talking about growing up in rural Nepal, so I would always have to travel through this kind of road, muddy. And every time I would have to travel to either to meet my relatives, either to go to my grandparents, or every time for even just for like one hour, if I have to travel, I'd always have to go through roads like this. If it's like dry, it would be so dirty that by the time you reach home, you'd, you'd be full of dirt. And if it's monsoon, it will be like this. And your, either your truck's tire would get stuck into it, or sometimes you'd have to walk in that. And I did not like that, how bad our roads were. And so this is like the road which I have to travel every time. And some people in Nepal say that it's the most dangerous road in Nepal. Some say even in South Asia, even in world. So what happens is like there is nothing to protect on the side. So when you are like traveling th through this road, there is nothing. If you fall down, there is no way you could come alive from that. And those are so narrow. And somehow if there is another vehicle coming from other side, it's super hard. You feel like, okay, I'm going to die right now. It is super. It is just scary to travel through that road. And again, I did not like that. So when you travel through that road, there is this temple, which is really famous in my district, my reason, because people believe that if you go there and ask for a wish, your wish is fulfilled. So there is even more traffic because of this temple. First thing, the road is narrow and it's in really top edge of the hill you might fall. And because of the temple, the traffic is even more. So again, there is more dangerous while traveling through that road. So uh, like three or four years ago, my dad uh, like tra got transferred to road construction department of Nepal. So he would, he, even though he was not an engineer, he would go along with his uh, colleagues to look at after like the road surveys and stuff because they were trying to build a road from the plain of Nepal going through hills to the 
mountains called Dor Patan Hunting Reserve where there was no any access to road. So the, he, would, he would always go with them. And then some, sometimes I also went along with them. And it was really interesting for me to see how they convince like the locals that you guys need this road and you guys have to give the land to the government and how, how carefully they were building the road on the edge of the hills, which seemed really interesting to me. So I really liked that. So this was just a photo of like the, during the construction time of that road. And growing up in Nepal, like it's really hard in comparison to teenagers or kids here in America, especially if you are a girl. So in Nepal, we have this thing that if you are in your periods, uh, you are considered impure. So it's sin if you go inside your house. Like, can you imagine that it's sin just to get inside your house? You can't touch anything. You can't go to temple. And uh, like, if your brothers uh, or your dad like already got confessed, you can't touch them. You just have to stay outside of your house. Like, can you see this small house? Like the hut, there is like a woman. So you'd have to stay in that and. Fetus is the time when you need the most care. And in, in that time, we have the bad tradition that we are considered impure and we are not given enough care. And there are so many cases that women die from getting a snake bite or like getting not enough imp, uh, nutrition during that time. So since my parents were educated, I didn't really have to go through that. But every time I would visit my grandparents, they would, have, they would make me go through that. Like, I never hated my grandparents, but once I remember when I got my periods when I was visiting them, I literally cried. I did not want to stay with them anymore because it's just like, you don't even feel like you belong there. So I really hated it. So I started this project called Happy Periods where I did my best or tried some, uh, took some effort to put the go uh, tell people that, okay, having your periods is not impure. So I took an effort to put the young girls in school and you should go to school while, while you are in periods. So this is one of the braids in Nepal. So uh, in my sophomore year of my high school, uh, I was on a vacation with my family in Western part of Nepal. So when I saw this braids, I was really mesmerized. Like this braids was designed by some American engineers and you can see like this bridge, it's so huge, but it's, it stands just by one pillar, like one pillar. And I was just amazed. Before that, I had always seen bridges which, just, which had a lot of pillars to like help them stand. And it just had one pillar. And then I realized, oh, there are so many possibilities from engineering. Even before I liked how roads were constructed. And now after this, I just okay, decided I want to be a civil engineer. So yeah, I was searching for the photos with the Rotary Fellowship Exchange team, which went back to Nepal. I could not find any. So this is just the photo I found of my host dad, your district governor, Edwin Bose, and Joy Berg, and my brother, and me when I was 14 years old, and one of the Rotarian from Nepal. And if it wasn't for these guys, I wouldn't be here. Super. Thanks, Isa. So your plan was to go back to Nepal. I know they have, there's a great university in Kathmandu that has an excellent civil engineering program, and that was your plan. Um, tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, I always planned that I would come here. I mean, after you guys got me opportunity to do the road tree ethics, and I would go back to Nepal and get my civil engineering degree. But after I started school here, I started to see how different and how good the education system is here, as well as how many opportunities are here in United States than in comparison to Nepal. And I started talking with my friends and everyone out there. And whenever they would ask me, what do you want to be in future? And I would always reply with, I want to be a civil engineer. And everyone, including you, told me that, why don't you look at other possibilities? There is University of Wisconsin Platteville. And then I Googled about it and I searched about it and I realized, yeah, that's a really good opportunity and a possibility. So I started looking into that possibility. So I decided I would go to UW Padville for getting a civil engineering degree. So I started working on my application and I started taking the ACT test and I got admitted to UW Padville. 
And then after that, you and I went to visit the tour. And I think it was the first time they had an international student in their school, even before starting the, their uh, study in the uh, university. So I had a pretty good uh, interview with my international officer. And I got scholarship. Yeah, now I'm planning to attend UW Platteville. So that's the big reveal, right? That yeah. you're going to be staying with yeah. us in Wisconsin if things go right. Um, you okay with, I just quickly explain to everybody listening, because I think a lot of people are wondering, how is she going to pay for that? Or how's this going to come about? Sure. Is that good with you? Sure. Just for everyone out there, the a international education at UW Platteville is about a $30,000 a year ticket. Um, Platteville was generous enough to offer ESA a scholarship and some tuition remission. And those two things in combination with the fact that her interview with the international office went so well that they basically offered her a job during the school year, those three things, and then also her parents are able to contribute a little bit, will basically cut that $30,000 in half. So at this point, we're looking at a $15,000 ticket. Um, yeah, so my goal is to pay for all by myself. So I'm planning to apply for re residence assistance after my freshman year, as well as my international officer told me that I could apply for more scholarship after my freshman year. So I'm looking into that. Okay, so Issa's planning to pay for it all by herself, which if you know the United States, Issa, that might not happen. So um, it's a great goal to have, but we have some Rotarians in the district and some non-Rotarians who've been generous enough to backstop that financial plan of yours just a little bit. And if anyone else out there wants to be part of that backstop, just drop your name in the chat or contact me directly and we can share some more details about that with you. But I've got one more thing I haven't told you about yet. Remember that civil engineering firm that wanted to have you present to them? In fact, I think you gave that same slideshow to the civil engineering firm sometime back in May. Um, Issa did a Zoom presentation to all their offices in the Midwest, and I think they have eight or nine offices. Based on that presentation, Issa, someone in the company wants to offer you, offer you a summer civil engineering co-op position. Um, the gentleman said that he considered your presentation to be an excellent job interview, and there's no guarantees to that because their business is down and COVID-19 is happening. No guarantees, but that is looking very good. And that's going to really assist Isa as well with, uh, with paying for her education. Well, that was unexpected. That is exciting. So, yeah. And, but you forgot something. We had a meeting with Plat Rotary Club of Platteville back in May, and they told me they would help me to settle in there and teach me how to drive. Yeah, we forgot that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> um, hey, I think I hear somebody whispering in. Brian, is Brian there? Is Brian on with us? Hi, guys. I'm here. Hey, Brian. <laughs> nice to see you both. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, yeah, um, we, uh, just for everybody else out there, um, Edlin contacted us a couple of weeks ago and just let us know about the uh, um, Issa's uh, new possibilities here, and we're very excited uh, about her coming down to this area. We've got a, a number of people in our club who are uh, part of the part of the uh, university community. Uh, we also know a number of people, a number of professors. I know in one particular, I know one of the civil engineering professors. There are a bunch of good people, and uh, so we're looking forward to helping her with just getting around the community, knowing you know, knowing where to go to get stuff. Um, I did say that I have an old truck and I'd, I'd uh, take a, a whack at teaching Issa to drive if she wanted to. I, I've taught two other teenagers to some success, I guess I would say. So, um, yeah, but we're really looking forward to having her down here. Um, it'll be just, she can be sort of a, a pseudo exchange student for all of us and she'd be welcome at our meetings. There's a good, uh, a very good road rack club at uh, UWP, which I'm sure she'd be a part of. And uh, we're just looking forward to being able to help out in any way we can. Thanks very much, Brian. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So Issa, perfect plan from here on. It's really simple. July 7th, you hop on a plane, fly back to Kathmandu, 
stop and say hi to your folks for a while, interview with the U.S. Embassy for your visa, pick up an F-1 visa, say hi to your friends, fly back to Platteville at the end of August, start school. We had it all figured out, right? Well, that sounds like a perfect plan while speaking, but in practical, that is quite different because of all this COVID stuff. Now I have new challenges to face with. First thing, I have my return ticket for July 7th, but I don't even know whether I'll be able to get back to Nepal on July 7th since the airports are closed, as well as the embassy is closed. So I don't even know if, I, if I'm able to go get back to Nepal on July 7th. I don't know whether the embassy will open up or not. So I don't know what will happen. So I'm thinking the best case scenario is somehow I get to go to Nepal on time. And since my classes start a little bit late than other universities, uh, I will like uh, the embassy will open up and I'll go for a visa interview and I'll get my visa and I'll be back here. Worst case scenario, this all this COVID stuff won't be done for next one year. So the embassy doesn't open up. So I get I will just stay in Nepal, I guess, for next year. And the absolute worst case scenario, everything goes right and the embassy opens up, but they don't give me a visa. Yeah, and these are the trials and tribulations of an international student. Uh, my own family has been through this for decades, so we know exactly what you're going through. Um, but on the other hand, you said if you or your parents or RFE, our RFE group had worried about the worst case scenario back in 2016, none of this would have happened. When we visited your town, it took us, it took us only four days to conclude that you were a needle in a haystack, that you were somehow uniquely special. And we were wrong. You might be a needle, but more importantly, you represent the haystack. The haystack is all the kids in all the countries all over the world that Kayla and Holland and Lynn and yourself just talked about. And the haystack is almost 100 interactors from Nepal, from District 3292, who are still listening right now, very late on a Saturday night, all of them just as qualified as you are. And all thanks to your wonderful culture, truly happy for you. Rotarians love a feel-good story, and I think you and I and others have delivered on a really nice feel-good story this year. But frankly, I hope this story and some of the other things we've talked about today leave everyone just a little bit sad sad in the realization that you are a needle, but that you were picked out of a, of a haystack made completely of needles. So what this boils down to, Issa, is that Uncle Edwin is telling you that in the big picture, you're not special at all. But in the eyes of District 6250, in the Fort Atkinson Rotary Club and of your host families, and especially in my eyes, you're very special. Uh, everyone has been talking about the main character of Harry Potter, but nobody ever thought that if there wasn't J.K. Rowling, all this Harry Potter would have never happened. So since like past year, I have been the Harry Potter for District 60 to 50. But if it wasn't for 10 Rotarians who went to Nepal back in 2016, who are the J.K. Rowling for this story? I would have never been the main character of Harry Potter. So I knew how to dream, but I always thought that there was a limitation or that I should put limitation on my dreaming. You guys gave me wings and taught me that I should dream beyond the limit. Thank you to all the 10 Rotarians who went back to Nepal, who went to Nepal back in 2016. Thank you to Jim and Lynn, Mark and Candy Modi, Dave Clements, Tom Beerley, Jean Papin, Joy Berg, 
and you and you you make you you guys made a made a exchange you might you guys made an impossible exchange possible with a country like nepal thank you again above all you have you have been the hero of my side of story i wouldn't be here if you hadn't given me the kindle back then to read harry potter but thanking you all about it would be unfair if i don't thank everyone who helped me during this my exchange year my host parents my just our district uh, rotary at exchange chair and everyone involved with rotary at exchange brenda tammy tammy jan and my uh, counselor bob, uh, jill and my rotary office rotary at exchange officer bob chick and everyone in my teacher and my coaches and my friends and because of my host families now i have three home three places in us to call my home even the country itself feels like home because of you guys and absolutely i would have to thank my own family my friends and district 3 to 9 too i don't have words to express how much grateful i am to all of you and everyone who helped me through my exchange year at last i would like to say never stop dreaming and yeah don't think that you have to dream to a limit start start dreaming beyond the limits joy rotary and this is my gift for you a gift for me or for our district for you you want me to open it right now sure Okay. Nice wrapping paper. Where did you find that? Oh, I think I <laughs> I was wondering what had happened with that thing. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm.